but um, at least this is part two. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize there was so much to it. You know, there's a lot of historical, a uh, lot of historical baggage to the subject. Well, we're ready for part three and four, five. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> by God's grace. <laughs> How's it going there, Sandy? Oh, she's got uh, her mic muted. So even if she was talking. Oh. There goes the PowerPoint. Was that on my end or was that on yours? Okay. Uh, okay. Are you ready, Sandy? Yeah, she's gonna go full screen. You're muted, Sandy. Hang on just a minute. Okay. I think we should have Ed do this. He did it so well when I was gone. <laughs> Where'd he go? Okay, never mind. I'm I'm a, I'm that's how I can read that. Just a second. Ah. Okay. Before we start. Okay, are we ready to begin? Go ahead. All right. I love the show far too to start. That's that really makes it uh, come to life. So this is Psalms 95, verse 1 through 7. And the Bible says, Oh come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God. The great king above all gods, his hand of the deep place of the earth, the strength of the hills is his also, the sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. <clears throat> and now the reason we're here today is because the fourth commandment tells us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and how it man.
Go ahead, Christian. I thought we uh, usually prayed before. That's why I didn't. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, let me put the screen back on. All right. So let's bow our head in prayer. Abba Father, I want to thank you so much that we can come before your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, to find grace and help in time of need. And Father, I'm asking that your Holy Spirit will be in this presentation. I'm asking that I'll get through the presentation uh, according to your plan and purpose. And Father, that you'll help me to bring out the things you would have me to say. And Father, that you will cause me to refrain from those things which you don't want me to say, that you will keep a watch over my lips and that you will fill it with your words. I thank you so much, Father. May it minister to all those who are hearing, to your honor and glory. We thank you so much in the name of Yeshua. Amen. And so last week we did the Omega of Deadly Heresies, part one. This is uh, part two of that same presentation. And... <clears throat> I, I realize that there's there's much ground in this subject matter to, to to cover, and so we looked at Kellogg's apostasy with the alpha of deadly heresies, which Ellen White had spoken about, and how that really came to fruition with many historical quotes, bringing out that the issue ultimately was not pantheism, but it was the pantheism was but a fruit of the underlying problem, which was the Trinity doctrine which we saw was Baal worship. So we want to get into part two, and I have a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to do the best uh, I can to, to cover uh, this uh, content that is in this presentation. And you'll see that I'm progressing from the time of Kellogg, from the time of the pioneers on to uh, more close to our present day, but still not quite touching where we're at now. Um, and we, we saw in the last presentation that Baal is the god of Babylon, and that, of course, the god of Babylon is the Trinity. Trinity is Baal worship. The Trinity was pushed in the heavenly courts because Lucifer wanted to be the third worshipped in heaven. The Trinity was pushed at the Tower of Babel. We saw that in the last presentation. We saw also um, that the Trinity was spread throughout all the heathen nations at the scattering of the tongues of, uh, of, at the Tower of Babel. Uh, that the Trinity set apart day is Sunday, the day of sun worship. So Trinity, of course, being Baal, is also the sun god. The Trinity was not believed by the Adventist pioneers. And lastly, that the Trinity was the central issue of Kellogg's apostasy by his own confession. But he failed to counter-reform Adventist non-Trinitarian position. It did, not, it did not gain traction in the church. It was stopped. So it did not overcome and it did not overthrow the church. But Ellen White did give many warnings. Also, very interesting statement from James White, the husband of Ellen White. And she said, he said very plainly, you can't, Grace? I'm in my car. Not right now, okay. Uh, Gracie, I'm, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, when, when you look at, uh, the testimony of James White concerning his own wife, he, he plainly said, she's not a Trinitarian. And that if a Trinitarian was to compare his creed against her writings, that they would condemn her writings. Okay. So that's a very interesting thing. We'll see that that is actually prophetic as to what would happen in the Omega apostasy. Now, this is what was said by J.S. Washburn to the General Conference in 1939. He was concerned about what he saw W.W. Prescott bringing in, that he was pushing the Trinity Doctrine now, something that Prescott had not done formally. And he said, the doctrine of the Trinity is a cruel heathen monstrosity, removing Jesus from his true position as divine savior and mediator. This monstrous doctrine transplanted from, transplanted from heathenism into the Roman papal church is seeking to intrude its evil presence into the teachings of the third angel's message. So you can see that this Trinity was something that the devil wanted to bring in the church for a long time. He was trying to do it in the early days of the message. and It was resisted by the, by Ellen White and the pioneers. 
Then with Kellogg, he had more success, but not quite so much success because it was still that uh, that fire was put out. But then at the next phase is after all the pioneers die, then you have Prescott and A.G. Daniels, and now they're pushing this and they're having more success, but still it's not quite so successful. And so Washburn says, listen, what's going to happen is that the the Trinity doctrine is trying to invade those who are teaching the third angel's message. He said, if we should go back to the immortality of the soul, purgatory, eternal torment, or the Sunday Sabbath, would that be anything less than apostasy? If, however, we leap over all these minor secondary doctrines and accept and teach the very central root, the doctrine of Romanism, uh, the Trinity, and teach that the Son of God did not die, even though our words seem to be spiritual, is this anything else or anything less than apostasy? And the very omega of apostasy. Very, very interesting that he says the cornerstone being the Trinity of Romanism. If we would go back to that, it is the very omega of apostasy, the worst kind of apostasy. Ellen White had warned the people. This is what she said. This was her final message on, this was her deathbed message. This is what she charged from the nurse to convey to the people. So she says, I'm charged to tell our people that we do not realize that the devil has device after device and he carries them out in ways that they do not expect. Satan's agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken and I desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know that I warned them fully before my death. She warns completely and saying there will be changes in the church after I die. And I want you to be aware of what's going to happen. So we weren't without a warning. She gave warnings and warned us fully. What were some of those warnings? Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast, she said. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in the theories that would remove the pillars of our faith concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or of Christ are working as blind men. So those who would bring in the Trinity doctrine, just as Kellogg was trying to do with the living temple, which is the context of this manuscript release. She says that they are working as blind men. Well, you think of Laodicean blindness and you know that this generation is a blind church. She said they are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Again, she says, in the book of Living Temple, there is presented the alpha of deadly heresies. The omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. Now remember, she said, I had warned them fully. Great changes will take place. The omega will come and it will be received by a certain class of individuals. She gave the warning. First selected messages, page 178. Be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith. Not a few will receive the Omega. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The Omega will be of a most startling nature. So Ellen White is already seeing, foreseeing that that when the Omega comes, it's going to be of a, of a great concern. She doesn't understand the full nature of it or the complexity of it, but she knows that God has shown it to her. And therefore she warns the people because she knows it will come. Adventist review was going to be a most startling nature. Well, here's a most startling change that is spoken by William G. Johnson, January 6th, 1994. Some Adventists today think that our beliefs have remained unchanged over the years, or they seek to turn back the clock to some point when we had everything just right. But all attempts to recover such historic Adventism fail in view of the facts of our heritage. Adventist beliefs have changed over the years under the impact of present truth. Most startling is the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Many of our pioneers, including James White, J.N. Andrews, Uriah Smith, J.H. Wagner, 
held to an Aryan or semi-Aryan view. That is, that the Son at some point in time before the creation of the world was generated by the Father, which is not Aryan, by the way. Um, it's just non-Trinitarian. Likewise, the Trinitarian understanding of God. Now part of our fundamental beliefs was not generally held by early Adventists. Even a few today do not subscribe to it. This was in 1994 that this was saying this, and it was a most startling matter. Benjamin Wilkinson writes a letter to Dr. T.S. Teeters in 1936. And so uh, Benjamin Wilkinson, he was uh, a minister in the church. And it says, replying to your letter of October 13th regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. I will say that the Catholic, or sorry, the Adventist, Seventh-day Adventists do not and ha never have accepted the dark, mysterious Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. What we will see is that B.G. Wilkinson was actually quite invested in this matter. He was opposed to the Trinity doctrine. He saw that it was dark, mysterious, Catholic. He saw that it was Babylonian. And he, did, he actually was living during the time when certain individuals were coming and bringing inroads for the Trinity, the chief doctrine of Romanism, the Omega, he saw as it was coming in and how he was repressed so that he was not able to address it as he wanted to. George Knight in Ministry Magazine, October 1993, said most of the founders of the Seventh-day Seventh Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More, specific, more specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, isn't that something? The founders find, found the church, and then the successors of the church say uh, to the founders, sorry, you're actually not allowed in this church anymore. You're not welcome in this church anymore. In fact, it was the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, which was working through the founders, the pioneers, to establish the pillars of our faith. What kind of unseemly device should come in the future in such a way that it would shut out its own founders, that it would pull down the pillars which they had established by the spirit of truth? And so when we look at Laodicea being blind, rich and increased with goods and having need of nothing in their own estimation, but yet actually poor, blind, miserable, wretched, naked, they're in a condition where the son of God, the one who gives the candlestick its oil, is shut outside of the church. Just like the founders would be shut outside of the church if they had been living today. The Trinity, we looked at Jerry Moon. Well, Jerry Moon writes a standard textbook that is found in Andrews University and uh, I think probably the other universities, Adventist University as well. It was co-written by um, uh, Reeve Whedon, uh, uh, Reeve Whedon and Moon. I'm trying to remember their names, but not uh, it's a peripheral issue. More recently, this is what uh, Jerry Moon says. More recently, a further question has arisen with increasing urgency. Was the pioneer's belief about the Godhead right or wrong? As one line of reasoning goes, either the pioneers were wrong and the present church is right, which means that they were reforming in the right direction, or the pioneers were right. And the present Seventh-day Adventist church has apostatized from biblical truth. Well, I mean, that's, that's quite black and white when it's colored that way. You can see a very interesting uh, logo of the Trinity in this book. And you can see the triquatra, which is, of course, a pagan symbol right in the middle. It's actually a, a sign of witchcraft. Very interesting. These three rings of fire coming together and making that triquatra. By the way, it's a Jerry Moon, John Reeve, and Woodrow Whedon. And you can actually see it right on the book there. Now, after the last pioneer died, it was J.N. Lockborough. He died in 1924. Some underhanded developments were taking place. The Ministerial Association of Seventh-day Adventism was established. Now, what does the Ministerial Association do and why is it dangerous? Well, this is on the official Ministerial Association website about the Ministerial Association. 
The Ministerial Association of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists exists to serve Jesus Christ in his global church. How? By ministering to pastors, pastors' families, local church leaders, administrators, departmental directors, and ministerial association secretaries. So essentially what he's saying is everybody at the top at every single level of the general conference, all of the leadership of the church, everything that governs and guides the church in leading into a certain trajectory, a certain direction, this is to minister to those that have their hands on the helm so that they can understand the way that they need to go. Well, isn't that interesting that you can then effectively bypass the congregations, bypass the people, bypass the church at large, and just go to the leaders that are leading the church so that, but what happens if the ministerial association gets into the wrong hands? What if it's established by the wrong people? What if the people that are establishing this ministerial association are an apostasy, and they're the ones that are ministering to the ministers in the church. So it says, uh, so this is what was said concerning the formation of the ministerial association. This was written, if I remember correctly, um, during it's in ministry magazine for their uh, 60th anniversary, something like this. And it says by 1926, A.G. Daniels was joined by Mead, Mead McGuire, uh, Mrs. J.W. Mace and Leroy Froome. That is a name we're going to explore a little bit more in this presentation to see who Leroy Froome was. With his previous experience as the editor of Watchman, Froome was the prime mover in establishing a separate periodical for ministers, a move that resulted in its first issue in 1928, speaking about Ministry Magazine, uh, is what was established, a, a magazine that goes for free to every single pastor of the church. So very interesting. Why are why is this happening after the pioneers had died, and why is Leroy Froome being the prime mover to want to minister to the the leadership in the church? Well, this is what Leroy Froome said in 1925, pretty close to the time when they were already establishing the ministerial institute. Um, he said, "I think." that new light will confirm the essentials of the past. I wonder what the essentials of the past are. We say, well, essentials of the past would be the pillars of our faith, but not to Leroy Froome. Some of the essentials of the past were the Nicene Creed, for example, of the Catholic Church. Some of the teachings of the Catholic Church ha happen to be the essentials of the past. And he said, I think new light will confirm the essentials of the past, though that does not mean that all the details must be retained as our founders laid them down. He said that the Herbert Camden Lacey, who was a known Trinitarian, uh, who also was part of subverting the church in a certain direction. Leroy Froome became the Associate Secretary of the Ministerial Association, so he had very much influence. January 8th, 1928, he inquires about something to Willie White because he's quite interested in hoping that something can be accomplished and if he can sort, sort of find inroads to tamper with Ellen White's writings. Why would he want to do something like that? We'll find out as we go along. Dear Brother Froome, yesterday's mail brought me your letter of January 3rd. In it, you present, present some queries calling for a reply from me. You refer to a memory of a conversation with me in which you think I remarked that mother said with reference to some of her writings, my work is to prepare, your work is to shape it up. You seem to think that there is such a statement as referred to in your letter. Uh, it would be, a be uh, uh, if there was such a statement as referred to in your letter, it would be a benefit to some of our brethren. I cannot comprehend how it would benefit them. Possibly you can make it plain to me. She has many times direct instruction from the angel of the Lord regarding what should be omitted and what should be added in new additions. Now, I, I did, I think I made a mistake here because there was more in the text and I accidentally uh, put it all together. So let me see if it's in the next, here, here it is. This is what's in between. Regarding the two paragraphs, which are found in spiritual gifts and also in the spirit of prophecy regarding amalgamation and the reason why they were left out of later books. And the question as to who took responsibility of living them out 
I can speak with perfect clearness and assurance. They were left out by Ellen G. White. No one connected with her had any authority over such a question. And I never heard of anyone offering to her counsel regarding this matter. In all questions of this kind, you may set it down as a certainty that Sister White was responsible for leaving out or adding to matters of this sort in the later editions of our books. So Leroy Froome is asking, tell me, is it possible that it could be a benefit to our ministers if we can shape up her writings? Because she gave, you know, she spoke it and now we can, uh, she prepared it and now we can do what we want with it. We can take out pieces, we can add in pieces, we can just sort of do what we want sort of in a pastiche manner. Well, this is what he said. Why will not, this is what Willie White said, why will not our brethren study God's merciful dealings to us by imparting information to us by the spirit of prophecy and its beautiful, harmonious, and helpful features? Instead of picking and criticizing and dissecting, trying to cut it up into little mechanical concrete blocks, such as we buy for our children to play with, and then ask somebody else to fit it together so that it will make a pattern that pleases them and leave out the particular parts of the pattern that they do not like. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, don't cut up Ellen White's writings and put it in sort of a fashion in a form that would please you. That would not be okay. You know, kind of like the devotionals are put together today or kind of like the book of evangelism or some of these other compilations are put together uh, this is not what is to be happening to pick and to criticize and to dissect and cut it up and then to put it together in a framework that could potentially give a false uh, idea of what she was actually saying. Taking things out of context. I don't know if your words have ever been taken out of context, but it's not nice when that happens because it makes you to say something that you never were actually saying. And White said that this would happen and that nothing would be able to stand in the way of what would happen. She says the enemy of souls has brought in the supposition that great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in the process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom had given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Well, one line of reasoning as it goes is that either the, either the pioneers are right and the present church is correct, or the pioneers are right and the Seventh-day Adventist church is apostatized from biblical truth, according to the words of Jerry Moon, right? Very interesting when you look at this, because she says, what is the kind of reformation that is supposed to come? What's the supposition? That the reformation would consist in giving up doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Particularly at this time, it was in the context of what Kellogg was doing, trying to get rid of the personality of God. So getting rid of the pillars of our faith, particularly of God, would be what? It would be a counter-reformation, right? We've reformed into this truth. And to go back would be apostasy from the truth and the you know, very omega of apostasy. She continues to say what would be the result of all this counter-reformation. She says a new organization would be established. New books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the counter-reformation in the church. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, Christ's presence standing outside the door, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. What is the fate of Laodicea? The blind leading the blind both fall into the ditch. But Jesus said, because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth, right? Storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. The foundation is built on sand. It does not endure the shaking. Well, very interesting. Counter-reformation is exactly the work of a certain class of individuals, the militant arm of the Catholic Church, the order of the Jesuits. 
Ellen White said the following about the Jesuits. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces hoping to accomplish its destruction. That is the Reformation. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. So if you're trying to destroy the Reformation, you want counter-Reformation. You want to undo the work of the Reformation, right? Cut off from every earthly tie and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience, wholly silenced. They know no rule, no tie, but that of their order, no duty but to extend its power. When appearing as members of their order, they, wear, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and poor, professing to have renounced the world and to bear the, the sacred name of Jesus, which went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the, the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable. When they served the interests of the church, under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up into council, as counselors of kings and shaping the policies of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people. And the children of Protestant parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. Well, that's startling because when you think of a Jesuit Pope, when you think of the European Union, having largely, and they've confessed this now, to a large degree, the leaders of the European Union are Jesuits, confessed uh, to be so. We know that Anthony Fauci, he says he is a Jesuit. He says so. He praises the Jesuit order. When you look at many individuals, there are many that are either Jesuit educated or involved directly with the Jesuits intimately themselves in the political and religious arena, but they disguise themselves. But now they're becoming bold to the degree that they don't feel they need to disguise themselves, except in regards to when they subvert religions or uh, it can be Muslims and it can be Jews and it's especially Protestants and it's especially Seventh-day Adventists. This is a counter-reformation so that there will follow a revival of popery and a falling away among Seventh-day Adventists. Remember, Baal worship has no spirit, right? The spirit of God is taken away. The holy fire is taken away. You don't have it. And so Elijah contends against those things and calls the people to repentance so that the rain can return, that the spirit of God can return, that the holy fire can fall. Now, look at what was said by Leroy Froome. May I here make a frank personal confession? Please do. When back between 1926 and 1928, I was asked by our leaders to give a series of studies on the Holy Spirit covering the North American Union Institutes of 1928. So this is a very early date, and the leaders are already asking, listen, deal with the subject of the Holy Spirit. Like, get the people in line. You wonder who's giving him his marching orders. So it says, I found that aside from priceless leads in the spirit of prophecy, there was practically nothing in our literature setting forth a sound biblical exposition in this tremendous field of study. There were no previous pathfinding books on the question in our literature. That's because it wasn't there because they were non-Trinitarians. I was compelled to search out a score of valuable books written by men outside of our faith. He went to Babylon to get insights about the Holy Spirit. What would he find? He would find the Trinity. Those previously noted for initial clues and suggestions to open up beckoning vistas to intensive personal study. Having these, I went on from there, but, uh, but they were decided early hopes and scores, if not hundreds, can confirm the same sobering conviction that some of these other men frequently had a deeper insight into spiritual things of God than many of our own men had on the Holy Spirit and the triumphant life. It was still a largely obscure theme in the movement of destiny by Leroy Froome. Is that not very concerning when we read those statements? 
because you can begin to understand what he's being asked to do. And he's going and finding insights from Babylon. And now he's going to push it in the church. And he's being commissioned by the North American Ministerial Institute to do this very thing, North American Union. Uh, now, what else does he say? In a letter to Otto Christensen uh, in 1960, he writes regarding the same years, 1927, 1928. So we're still kind of moving along in this trajectory. He says, may I state that my book, The Coming of the Comforter, was the result of a series of studies that I gave in 1927 and 19, to, to 1928 to ministerial institutes throughout North America. So when they established the ministerial association, they established ministerial bodies to minister to the people over. This is actually very much in line with what the Jesuit order does, with the spiritual practices uh, of Loyola, right? You have a mentor uh, of some sort. And so you have somebody above you to be able to instruct you, to guide you, a spiritual guide, as it were. And so this is what's being established. And now Leroy Froome is being given commission by some to teach these ministerial institutes about the Holy Spirit so that they can teach it properly. Well, how is it going to be taught? According to the teaching of Babylon. He says, you cannot imagine how I was pummeled by some of the old timers because I pressed on the personality of the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead. Some men denied that, still deny it. But the book has generally come to, uh, has come to be generally accepted as standard by 1960. So you can see how a great change begins to take place. Something sizable had to happen in the 1950s to cause it to happen. And there was an underhanded work in the 1930s and the 1940s leading to the co a controversy in the 1950s, which led to this sta state of, yeah, things are pretty normal now uh, as far as the Trinity doctrine is concerned. Now, by his own confession, we will get a little bit of a timeline, a little glimpse of it, and to see how the church changed after the founders died and the ministerial association was established. He says, while 1931 was the crucial year, it was more accurately the decade embracing the years of 1931 to 1941 that marked the pivotal turn of events for unity of belief in our post-1888 history, which is a very sad history, by the way, uh, because it it marked the beginning of the rejection of Christ. And this only amplifies that case. As seen, this 10-year period was introduced by the appearance of an acceptable statement of faith. Now received by all, the decade logically closed with the adoption in 1941 of the Uniform Baptismal Covenant and Vow in certificate form. This was definitely based upon but elaborated and accentuated the now generally accepted fundamental beliefs, Declaration of 1931. Now, I want you to understand something. There was never in 1931 a fundamental beliefs officially. There were four men who were chosen to write a, an unofficial yearbook. There was no conference vote on it. It, it completely bas bypassed all the leadership. Four men determined to make a yearbook and to make a set of fundamental beliefs. And the Ministerial Institute, the association, gave it to all the ministerial institutes to give it to all the pastors throughout the entire church, as though there was a, a church manual and a fundamental beliefs. They never said anything otherwise, and they kept silent because in their silence, it worked in their favor. But those 10 years would be very detrimental because before there was no baptismal vow, no baptismal covenant, no statement of faith that you had to subscribe to if you wanted to be baptized no fundamental beliefs, no church manual. Again, he said that because of this, they were prepared to present a united front. It was this covenant and vow, the baptismal document, that completed and implemented the fundamental beliefs profession of faith, making their declarations obligatory upon all candidates for admission to the church through baptism. Before long, this would, of course, automatically embrace all members aside from the old timers. Who were the old timers? the same ones that pummeled him about the identity of the Holy Spirit. Same ones that said and addressed that the Omega was coming in through the underhanded work of Leroy Froome. 
So this should be very startling to us, most startling, because we see a process of reorganization taking place. This is the foundation. Uh, the Trinity is the foundation of a new organization, and the organization is subtly changing. We think, hey, nothing changed. It's not true. Many things. It doesn't. We can't even recognize the church how it looked before. The commissioned task of this committee was to formulate a uniform baptismal covenant and baptismal vow to be printed in the form of an appropriate certificate, be it noted that this was based upon our fundamental beliefs stated of a statement of 1931. This certificate was to be used thenceforth by all ministers as an approved profession of faith for all candidates seeking admission and membership through baptism into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That means you can't be a member of the church unless you accept those beliefs. And so that is exactly what was being said uh, by George Knight, that the founders would not be able to. And it was only, uh, Jay and Lockborough would not be allowed to join the church only 15 years after his death. Consider how quick the change took place. As to the eternal verities, this covenant now appearing along with our fundamental beliefs statement in the church manual stipulates in explicit terms our united belief in the first, second, and third persons of the Godhead or Trinity, as well as trust in the atoning act of the cross. Now, that's a subtle thrust at 1844, by the way. To these, each candidate for baptism subscribes. They are thus set forth as an integral part of our profession of faith, acceptance of which is a requirement for entrance into the church of the remnant, meaning that those who can't accept this are standing outside the door knocking for entrance. Could it be that those that are standing outside are filled with the spirit of Christ, filled with the word of reproof that the church needs? This uniform baptismal certificate with its summary of declared Adventist beliefs in relation to our fundamental beliefs statement of 1931, in addition to specific emphasis on the three persons of the Godhead, two points in the vow are here emphasized that had not always been stressed in the past owing to formally divergent views thereon. So they, they people diverge. We don't care now whether you diverge or not. You have no say in it right? You have no say in it at all. They have completely repressed the matter. You have to vow in covenant to the Trinity, the sun God, Baal, if you're going to enter into the church. You want to know why the church hasn't gone far in the last 70 years? Further than that. It, it, why it hasn't gone far in 90 years? The spirit of God is not in the midst of the church. Why is it not in the midst of the church? Because Baal has been enshrined there. And so, if, so then all this praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 40 days of prayer, 50 days of prayer, 100 days of prayer, doesn't matter what you pray for, it's Baal worship. The Spirit of God is not going to fall in such a case. He said, we were no longer subject to a legitimate charge that on the eternal fundamentals, we were divided or in conflict with the testimony of the soundest Christian faith of the centuries. What? What is he saying? He said, well, now the Catholics and the Protestants can't say that we're divided on these eternal fundamentals that we agree with them on. We agree with them on the God of Babylon, right? It, they, it can't be, and it's not in conflict with the testimony of the soundest Christian faith of the centuries. What in conflict with what testimony of what Christian faith for centuries? At this point, the church is only a hundred years old. Centuries is multiple. He's speaking about the Catholic Church here. The culminating events of the decade 1931 to 1941 consequently marked the end of an old epoch and the beginning of a new day of unification, in unification, an auspicious witness for us as a movement. It was definitely another major turning point in our denominational history. You can see Leroy from how underhanded he is and how he is involved in the movements that are responsible for not allowing anything to stand in the way of the new movement and putting in this reformation, uh, a counter-reformation in its place. He actually, in other writings, has praised the Catholic Church, by the way. He continues. Remember, Ellen White said books of the new order would be written. Well, actually, old book, the books of the old order would be rewritten. 
that's what they wanted to do with Ellen White's writings as well. But Leroy Froom didn't really have the freedom to do that. So he got, he, he was a little bit, uh, the Jesuits were quite uh, ingenious in this and they used some ingenuity. So this is what he says. So in 1944, we're going along in the years again. Soon after the adoption of the uniform, uh, uniform baptismal covenant vow and certificate of 1941, the revision of Daniel and Revelation, Uriah Smith, was undertaken. A representative committee was set up to include the book editors of the three main North American publishing houses. They're going to do something very serious. But I'm, uh, what they do is they actually they start crossing out, pen knifing all the statements of non-Trinitarianism from Daniel and Revelation. They actually start to change the hymnal, by the way. They, they order all the hymnals before that time to be sent back to the general conference and they burn them. Why would they do that? They burn all the old hymnals? Older hymnals are harder to find. Benjamin Wilkinson, the one who uh, said that the, there was that we don't ne, Seventh Day Adventists have never believed in the dark, mysterious Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. He wrote the book True Triumphant, which Leroy Froome commissioned to be destroyed in 1944. What did it say that Leroy Froome was concerned about that he told the Review and Herald to destroy his printing plates that he was not even able to get replaced? Only 800 copies of Truth Triumphant was printed. God spared that book, by the way. He had his hand on it. And by the digital age, it was massively recopied. But okay, what did it have in this statement that Leroy Froome was so scared of that he had to tell them, shut, destroy the plates. Don't print any more. The burning question of the decades, this is in Truth Triumphant regarding the Waldenses and the church in the wilderness and the apostasy of the Catholic church. The burning question of the decades succeeding the Council of Nicaea was to state the relations of the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Then the papal party proceeded to call those who would not subscribe to this teaching, that's the Trinity, Arians. Well, they took themselves the titles of Trinitarians. It's on page 85, page 318. In an earlier chapter, it was noted how the papacy stigmatized as Arians, those who disagreed with her in general. And in particular, how she branded those as Judaizers, Judaizers who were convinced that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment was the seventh day. One second. So you can see, look at how truth triumphant was actually against uh, the, the Trinity. Now you can see that this is cut off. It's really unfortunate that that was cut off. I fixed the slides and then my computer crashed and I guess it didn't, it didn't uh, autosave really unfortunate i can see if i can get that back up just one moment here i'm going to i know you can i think you can still see the screen can can you no you can't let me just bring this up i'm just going to make it so that we can see those pictures because these are pretty important statements one moment here yeah okay is there any more? Just make one more. I think. I'm just gonna make sure it's not as much uh, loss, but it's okay. It's uh, we need to be able to read the statements. Okay. Let's see slideshow. All right. Coming back now. Screen share. And there we go. You can at least read it. Uh, he said, the next logical and inevitable step of implementing our unified fundamental beliefs involved revision of certain standard works so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated er erroneous views on the Godhead. This was in the movement of destiny. Um, he said, these productions must therefore be brought into harmony with the now declared faith of the church. Such an undertaking meant treading on delicate ground to some still a personal semi-Aryan persuasion, that's non-Trinitarian. Daniel and Revelation was holy ground, as it were. The council proceeded to approve the report of the committee and the several Aryan statements of Daniel and Revelation were accordingly eliminated. That was 18 statements, by the way, not a few, not just several, not down, he's really downplaying it here. Thus, the volume was brought into theological harmony with our fundamental beliefs statement in the yearbook and 
church manual still has Uriah Smith's name on it, by the way, the baptismal covenant and vow, as well as the declaration of the spirit of prophecy on these points, the revised Daniel and Revelation continues to be circulated in this form. Changing the books. Movement of Destiny, page 621. said, later, when I connected with the Ministerial Association of the General Conference, I did considerable research in the Spirit of Prophecy writings on this subject. I found much more statements regarding the Trinity, or so he thinks. And when we were asked to help in compiling the Book of Evangelism, these and many other councils became a vital part of that book. Note the section, the message, and its presentation. Very interesting that Leroy Froome openly confesses not only that he had a, a big part to play in the book of evangelism, which maybe you, some of you have on your bookshelf, but that it was in the book of evangelism was to minister to who? The ministers, leaders, the evangelists, the Bible teachers, the pastors of the church, right? And so he connects with the ministerial association and he's the one compiling the book. It's got a statement of the Trinity in it where it has a lot of quotes taken out of context from Ellen White's writings that make it appear that she affirmed the Trinity when she didn't. This was in 1946. This is what Leroy Froome said to Roy Allen Anderson, who was also um, part of this process. He said, I'm sure that we are agreed in evaluating the book Evangelism as one of the great contributions in which the ministerial association had a part of part back in those days. You know what it did to the men in the Columbia Union who came face to face with the clear, unequivocal statements on the spirit of prophecy, on the deity of Christ, personality of the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and the like. Remember, uh, Kellogg was also reading those statements, but he was also confused by them. And Ellen White had affirmed that he was misunderstanding those statements. Leroy Froome was making the same assertions and pushing them on the church and getting everybody to read it in the same perspective through the same Babylonian eyes. They either had to lay down their arms and accept those statements or else they had to reject the spirit of prophecy. You know what it did to the men in the Columbia Union. They were all non-Trinitarian in the Columbia Union. They either had to lay down their arms or accept those statements or else they had to reject the spirit of prophecy, right? By the 1950s, 1955, 1956, there was the evangelical conferences, and we're going to see how James White prophecy of condemning Ellen White's writings came to pass right in the midst of the church because they had now made a Trinitarian creed. Leroy Froome wrote a letter to Walter Martin, who wrote the book Rise of the Cults, and he had said that Seventh-day Adventism was a cult. So Leroy Froome says, listen, you don't have this straight. We're not a cult. Walter Martin had a certain uh, predefined criteria of what Orthodox Christianity, what evangelical was classed as. And if you wanted to be evangelical, you needed to agree with the doctrine of the Trinity. The atonement was finished at the cross. You had to believe in certain fundamental uh, beliefs, as it were. And so Leroy Froome said, listen, we're, we are Orthodox Christians. Don't say we're cult. And so they end up Create, having a meeting of secret evangelical conferences during these years with Leroy Froome, Walter Reed, Edgar Un Unruh, and Roy Allen Anderson. And uh, Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson, we know for sure were Jesuits. As far as the rest, uh, probably, but we're unsure. Uh, at least I'm unsure. This, these were the these were the uh, the objectives for these four Adventist. Uh, leaders to prove that the SDA denomination should not be classified by the evangelical Protestant world as a non-Christian cult. And the second objective was for the evangelicals to reclassify the Seventh-day Adventist denomination from a non-Christian cult to one of the evangelical brethren. Well, that sounds very friendly, right? To be classed sort of in a nice, friendly, ecumenical association of evangelical brethren now. We're no longer separated from Babylon, but we now are counted in the same fold. So what, how did, these pro, how did this process sort of all unfold? Well, during the very same year, Leroy Froome is very excited and he speaks very cryptically to the general conference president. Uh, uh, and so he says the following, the time has come for some things to happen. And I believe that there is opportunity now to go forward with certain things. I know that I'm speaking of gener in generalities and parables. I'm not speaking clearly, speaking with veiled language. 
But if I get into particulars, it would take too long and I would have to explain the whole thing. Well, that's how Jesuits speak in much secrecy, right? The time has come forward. Uh, the time has come for some things to happen. Let's move forward with certain things now. Let's let's establish some ties through these conferences. Well, what ends up happening? Again, it looks like uh, the statement was cut off. How many? It's only one of them. That's okay. I can probably only read half of this. So this is uh, Walter Martin. He's giving an interview uh, at Loma Linda University. And he says, the climate at that time, Adventism was considered like Jehovah's Witnesses, like Mormonism, uh, like most of the major cultic structures of the day. When I first met Ellie Frum, Leroy Frum, he took me to task about 15 minutes on how I could ever possibly think that Adventism was a cult. Adventism rings true as steel, I said. Do you think Arius was a Christian? Is what This is what uh, Walter Martin is saying. Uh, and of course, he was an excellent Bible uh, uh, church historian. And he said, of course, he wasn't a Christian. He denied the deity of Christ. And so Walter Martin says to Leroy Froom, so did Ellen White. What is the response of Leroy Froom? Leroy, Dr. Froom said, what? I said, yes. And then I produced the quotations and I opened up a suitcase and produced at least 12 feet of Adventist publications stacked up and marked for Dr. Froome's perusal and, and for the perusal of the committee to check the sources in there. Here are all non-Trinitarian statements by Ellen White. And he's, he's just, he highlighted all of them. Very good student, at least. And they found that everything I said in there was true. And they were a mortal shock that I, I might add to think that it was as pervasive as it was, the non-Trinitarian statements. Mrs. White reversed herself later on quick, very quickly and affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity very strongly and taught it. This is wrong again. But she was influenced by, by Uriah Smith. Strange. Because remember, she said she never changed her view on the personality of God. And James White said she was a non-Trinitarian. She did deny the eternal deity of Christ at one time and relegated him to the place of second deity. That's why you were classified with the Jehovah's Witnesses early on because of the Arian emphasis in Adventism and because of the fact that you affirmed Michael the Archangel to be Christ, which is true, right? Which is a true statement. He is Christ. Dr. Froome and the committee decided that they would peruse this material immediately. Okay. What ends up happening? What is Leroy Froome's response to these once they go through all this material and they reconvene? So we adjourned the meeting and they took all the material with them and I guess others and went through the materials. They went back and said, well, a great deal of these things that you're calling attention to are there. They confessed that, yes, she was non-Trinitarian. We agree. And we don't, we don't agree with those statements. What did James White say? The Trinitarian might compare them with his creed and condemn them because they do not agree with her statements. They do not reflect, Leroy Frum said, orthodox Adventist theology, and we reject it. They just rejected Ellen White's writings in these secret conferences. I said, good, happy to hear that. Now you can fault us because when we read this material, it's not peripheral issues we're talking about. We went through all kinds of material, and then the idea came for a book where we would write questions to the Adventist denomination that they would respond. And out of that came a book called Questions on Doctrine. Contrary to some of the fantasies and myths, which I hear today from Adventists, which ought to know better, the book had the approval of the General Conference, and that's true. It, it was, the Questions on Doctrine was a very heretical book that ended up coming out, and it denied many positions of the Adventist church with respect to 1844 and also with with the investigative judgment with the uh with the nature of Christ, with regard to the nature of christ not believing in original sin <coughs> because we don't believe in original sin uh and also with regard to the trinity now in eternity magazine donald barnhouse who's also part of those meetings he was an evangelical protestant 
in September 1957 said immediately it was perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions that they had previously attributed to them. The Adventists specifically repudiate any teachings by ministers or members of their faith who have believed, proclaimed, or written any matter which would cl classify them among Arians, including Ellen White, including the pioneers. They rejected them wholesale. And so when anybody's baptized, they're baptized as a member of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. They're baptized into that church. So, and you have to take a covenant vow to the Trinity, the, which is Baal worship. So if you think about all these things together, alarm bells start to go off in your mind. You say, wait a second, they just rejected everything, but I affirm those things. Where do I belong? I, don't, I certainly don't belong with these people. Roy Allen Anderson, <laughs> after 1980, said the following in the Adventist Review regarding the meetings, because he was there. He said, what do you folks believe about the Trinity? That was the question asked and <laughs> put to me some years ago by two gracious Christian gentlemen who came unannounced to the General Conference headquarters in Washington, D.C. One of them was commissioned to write a new book about Adventist beliefs. However, <clears throat> they felt that they should contact the headquarters to discover what we actually believed on points of vital interest rather than just quoting from others. The answers to their earnest questions lengthened into days of prayerful discussions. <clears throat> Our answer concerning the Godhead and the Trinity was crucial, for in some of the books they had read that Adventists were classed as Arians. We assured the visitors that <clears throat> when we had turned first to the scriptures, then to the fundamental beliefs of Adventism, look to the fundamental beliefs, not to Ellen White's writings. They discovered that we were in harmony with sound biblical scholarship, not only on the Trinity, but on every other cardinal doctrine of Christianity, as Babylonianism, by the way. This was the book, Questions on Doctrine. What did George Knight say about it? The authors at times pushed the facts a bit too far on such issues as Adventism's historic understanding of the Trinity, and even their present, even present their data in a way that creates a false impression on the human nature of Christ but give the desire to please and the importance of the answers. The volume overall is a remarkably courageous statement of traditional Advent, Adventist doctrinal understanding, <coughs> despite being entirely false. <coughs> what did B.G. Wilkinson say about Leroy Froome during that time? Well, this was what was written to the General Conference President, Reuben Figure. I was publicly denounced at the chapel in, the Was in Washington Missionary College by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson as the most dangerous man in this denomination. We're getting more to our time and I'm almost finishing up here. Truth triumphant. I already read those statements, so I'm not gonna read them again, but there was a good reason why Leroy Froome commissioned those plates to be destroyed. It's because it was effectively a non-Trinitarian book. There was a court case in 1976, just before the church manual and the official fundamental beliefs was made a general conference vote to be official in the church. It was made official without anybody knowing that it was gonna be made official. It's just saying, let's go over this because this is gonna be the new official yearbook, the Adventist church manual. And everybody's like, yeah, it's, it's orthodox, it's good, let's pass it. Because they were so used to for 50 years having the ministerial institute putting an unofficial manual on them and an unofficial statement of beliefs that it was nothing to the next generation to just say yeah okay it reads good let's pass it well in 1976 uh, neil wilson was in a legal case uh a, a lawsuit and and this was what he was uh, he was uh giving testimony he says although it is true that there was a period a period in the life of Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took an anti, distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint. And the term hierarchy was used in a pejorative sense to refer to the papal form of church governance, meaning that the church did not believe in hierarchy, right? That attitude on the church's part was nothing more than a widespread uh, anti-popery uh, among, a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among uh, conservative, Protestant denominations in the early part of the century and the latter part of the last, and which now has been consigned to the historical trash heap 
as far as Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. Have you thrown out the position of the church, of Protestantism? Have you uh, stopped protesting against the Catholic Church and the church's structure of the papacy? Not saying organization is bad, but the church had a process of reorganization where it modeled, modeled itself after the Catholic Church. Most people don't realize that the, that the Adventist Church today is largely in the same structure as the Advent, uh, the Adventist Church today, the General Conference, is in the same form as the Roman Catholic Church. Most people don't realize it, but it wasn't that way before. And that, so to say anything against it, well, no, the General Conference Adventist Church has thrown that away. It's consigned to the trash heap. So what do you say? Let's finish this up here. The last presentation uh, by General Conference President Robert Pearson gives a warning in his earnest appeal, his final presentation where he says he's going to retire on October 16, 1978, just before, one year before. 1979 is when Neil Wilson's going to become the church president. He, Robert Pearson's going down, Neil Wilson's coming up. Look at this transition. There's about three more slides. This will be the last time that in my present role, I shall stand before the world leaders of my church, your church, our church, and have a few words to leave with you. Already, there are subtle forces beginning to stir. We are not Seventh-day Anglicans, not Seventh-day Lutherans, Seventh-day Babylonians, right? We are Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventist church had its alpha years ago. You and I are the leaders who will face the Omega that will be of the same subtle devilish origin. Its effects will be more devastating than the Alpha. Study. Know what is ahead. Then, with God's help, prepare your people to meet it. Fellow leaders, it may be that in not too distant a future, you will have to meet it. Well, next year, Neil Wilson becomes General Conference President. Look what happens as he pushes through the Omega of Deadly Heresies to become the official church position as they finally crystallize, solidify the fundamental beliefs in the church and the church manual with the Trinity doctrine. This before now, it was unofficially official. Now it was embedded. Uh, it, was, it was ingrained right into the very cornerstone uh, of the whole organization. It was a complete reorganization of the church in this 1980 meeting. By the way, the results of that 1980 meeting had the evangelical ministers congratulating. They, the leaders were present at that general conference, and they gave a astounding ovation to, uh, the, to the, the church for now being officially uh, evangelical. Very interesting developments. Neil Wilson said this, the father of Ted Wilson. For some time, we have been considering a refinement of our statement of fundamental beliefs. I think you have the document in your hands. No doubt you have done some studying and some praying. We have heard a variety of interesting rumors. Some, it is said, understand that the church leaders want to destroy completely the foundations of the church and set the church on a course that would be unbiblical contrary to the tradition of the past and to historical Adventism, my fellow delegates. There is nothing that is further from the truth. Hmm. Interesting. There were people that were very concerned about this general conference and what was going to take place. What was said? He said, we have also heard that at any time we touch the statement of fundamental beliefs, we would be introducing the Omega the final confusion of theological doctrinal positions in the Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventist Church. I suggest to you that this is also a very unfortunate statement. Isn't it amazing, P pretty astounding, that we see Robert Pearson giving a warning and says, we may have to meet this very soon. And it comes not, a, it's only a year and a half later, and already this is the issue. It's already being pushed through, and they're trying to silence the people that are meeting it. By 1981, Neil Wilson says this. <sighs> Pretty, this one's, this one's quite, quite hard. This is the logical conclusion of all this that has happened. 
he declares in 1981, the Adventist Review, there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is the conclusion of what ended up happening with the church because of the omega of deadly heresies. The question is, where do we stand in this issue? Where do we belong in this issue? Because can we be part of Babylon? No, God forbid we should be a partaker of Babylon and its cornerstone of, of anything that it affirms. Come out of her, my people. It's a very startling change, and most people don't realize it because it was so subtle. The Jesuits are very subtle in the way that they do things. I understand that this was the underhanded way to subvert, to counter-reform the church, and to build bridges back to the Catholic Church. Now, if Sandy will ever have me again, I will do part three, and I'll show you how this develops into the next phase, which is a very serious thing as well. So let's pray and close. And uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate you taking the time to hear. Merciful Father in heaven, thank you so much, Father, for giving us the warning through the spirit of prophecy that you have warned us fully, uh, diligently, and you've given us an abundance of history, historical testimony. And Father, we see underhanded movements took place in the, in, in the Adventist church, a counter-reformation. We see that Jesuits did uh, they crept in unawares uh, to undermine the faith, to deny uh, you, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah. Father, I'm asking that you will give us the proper standing, that we can be the voice that we need to be, even if we are shut out from the church, that we will speak according to the spirit of the Son of God. And Father, that we will stand with the pillars of our faith, that we will stand for that which was established by your spirit in the church originally, that we will stand with the fathers, that the children's hearts will turn to the pioneers as their fathers, that will turn also to the faith of the apostles, that we will turn back to you, Father, and that you will give us the rain, the latter rain in its season, because we have accepted and embraced the early rain of having that cornerstone doctrine of the truth about you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We thank you so much, Father, for this. Guide us and lead us by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Christian, I just wanted to thank you and thank Dave for today um, from the bottom of my heart. And I want to thank Sandy for this platform that